Welcome back to Bout Time Prophecy. This is part two on the subject of the day or hour no one knows from Matthew 24, 36. In this video, I want to encourage the spark of curiosity about when Jesus is coming back into a flame that affects your entire life and your walk with Jesus. I'm going to give some examples of Bible characters who asked about the end of time and were given answers. I'll also give a likely date of Jesus' return and the tribulation. Maybe talk about the feast days and how they are time trackers and how keeping time is actually part of God's nature. Easy stuff, right? In Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 and 14, it says, Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this, and humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. Now I have come to give you understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. As we talked about in part one, even Jesus wants us to understand the timing. In Matthew 24, verse 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Jesus wants us to understand this stuff. And in the book of Daniel, he was asking about time tracking aspects of things to come. And not just things to come in his future, our future. In Daniel 12 verse 9 it says, He said, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the time of the end. Amos 3 7 also says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. This is also talked about in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 46 10, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, and what is still to come. Our God is a God of wisdom and knowledge that he shares with his servants, that he shares with his beloved children. We know that he fulfills his promises, and we can know that he will fulfill his prophecies and his appointments. But one thing to know about knowing the end of time is it's not for everyone. It's for the righteous and the watchful. If you study the back end of the book of Daniel and you study Matthew 24, you get the idea that there are certain types of characteristics for the people who will know and understand the time of the end. These characteristics are the righteous and the watchful. Now by righteous, I mean people whose sins have been washed away. Being righteous means that the debt of sin has been paid in full, and this has been done by Jesus' work on the cross. Being righteous means that you're following Jesus after having sins washed away through baptism in his name, that you've confessed Jesus is Lord, meaning you have forsaken all sin and dedicated your life to following Jesus. Jesus and being made more and more into his image. That's righteous. It's not a righteousness of what we are doing so much as the righteousness that is given to us as we join Jesus's kingdom. He gives us his spotless record of doing everything right and nothing wrong. We are given righteousness. And with that righteousness, the opportunity to be watchful and discover when he will be returning to call us to him in the clouds. Now, it's not completely necessary to know the date of Jesus's return to still be, in a sense, ready, but it does come at a cost compared to knowing the date of his return and being exactly ready for that day. But we'll get into that later. But for the wicked, which just means who are not forgiven of sins. For the wicked, Jesus comes like a thief in the night, that it's a surprise and people are found not ready. 
2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now next I want to read you Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. And there's a very important if statement in this verse. And in Bible verses, when there's an if statement, there's a opposing not statement. So if you do this, you will get that. And then sometimes that's all the Bible verse says. But you can also think if I don't do this, I will not get that. It's just logically true. Revelation 3, 3 says, So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. So what will happen if they do wake up and repent? It's not just for the wicked who will not understand and will be caught unawares. It's also for believers who do not understand the times and the seasons and are not looking for the return of Jesus. To them he will also come like a thief in the night. But for those who do understand the times and the seasons, they get to be the wise men and women of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The righteous and wise will understand the timing of the tribulation and the coming of Jesus. Check out what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 4 says. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Now there's a lot more other verses that talk about knowing, not knowing, being alert, or being surprised. But they all agree with Daniel 12 verse 10. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. If I have piqued your curiosity of the timing of the end and the time trackers that are in Scripture, let me encourage you with James 1.5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Jesus wants you to know the timing of his return. He literally says, know that it is near, right at the door. It's a command to us to understand the signs to look for, and that when we see them, know that the time is near. In this video, I'm going to add the time tracker of the Feast of Trumpets. And from my previous videos, please check them out if you haven't seen them. There's time trackers of Jubilees, the thousand year a day time tracker that we can put together that 2000 years after the year 27 AD on the Feast of Trumpets, we can expect Jesus to return which was the start of the acceptable year of the Lord's ministry, which is also likely a jubilee year. All these things are time trackers that lead us to tracking the time of Jesus's return. Now, you might be thinking, I've been studying the Bible for this many amount of years, and I've read so many books. I've also heard a lot of people give out dates for what, when they think, and they were all wrong. Why is this any different from any of that? And that's a very legitimate question, but let me propose a appeal to Jewish thought. 1800 years of anti-Semitism has all but snuffed out all the Jewish thoughts, customs, and sayings that were prevalent in Jesus's time that has left the modern day church with an eschatology puzzle built with missing pieces. This has caused many to misinterpret many scriptures or interpret them with limited information. Sadly, we are paying the price of this from the as early as fourth century church leaders who completely rejected all of Israel after their destruction in 70 AD. Many of the commentaries and church leaders' writings about the Jewish people uh, post fourth century um, blamed them for Jesus's death, even though Jesus says, I lay my own life down for the sheep. 
The bottom line is the church's greatest theologians and Christian authors, perhaps unwittingly, have kept us on a steady diet of Christian theology and eschatology, but stripped of its Jewish thoughts, traditions, and customs, many of which hold time-tracking aspects that lead us to Jesus' second coming. This channel's main focus is time in the context of Bible prophecy regarding Jesus' second coming. Time is a very important aspect to our Creator, who invented time, and it's time-keeping. Ever since he invented time, he's been keeping track of it. Since the very beginning, He's been setting up systems for it and even giving us time tracking capabilities for our benefit in keeping time. Genesis 1.14 says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. At first glance, you might just be thinking that God is setting these up for our seasons, our years, and our months. But in the ancient Hebrew, one of those words carries weight that our non-Jewish minds might not catch on to right away. The primary reason for God setting the sun, the moon, and the stars in their place was to mark specific periods of God's time as opposed to general periods of secular time. God made the sun, the moon, and the stars for all people to enjoy, but their arrangement and movement was given specifically to God's chosen people so that they could accurately keep his appointed times, called Moedim, and his Sabbaths, two things that are both shadows of a coming light to the world. So let's look at that specific word in Genesis 1.14 that most translations have as seasons. This can be a little misleading for many of us because when we think of seasons, we think of spring, summer, fall, and winter. But this word is not those things. The Hebrew word is moedim. And this word can mean many other things, but in this particular verse means the seven holy feast days that we can read about in Leviticus 23. These moedim are very unique and we don't have a lot of things to compare them to, but think of them as a movie preview, a family devotional, and a dress rehearsal all combined into one. Another way to look at them are holy convocations. A convocation is kind of like a dress rehearsal for a really important ceremony. And for God and his Moedim, he was setting up convocations to prepare his chosen people for the messianic story of redemption. Each of these seven feasts are just one-seventh of the great picture of what God would do to confirm his covenant with his people. These convocations point to a future event. That's why it says in Genesis let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from night. They shall serve as signs for the set times, the days, and years. I can call this a divine appointment schedule in the sky. It's like an alarm clock in the sky for God's chosen people for when the Messiah will do his great wonders. When you look in Leviticus 23, you see these moedim, or these appointments, all laid out. And what, what is an appointment? It's a future event that you prepare for. It means they're prophecies, descriptions of things that will happen in the future. God's seven feast days give clues and descriptions about God's grand week of striving with man. Hinted at in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 except these appointed times have nothing to do with the year count. Instead, they describe specific days and their events, not the year. They tell a story each year about coming days when certain major messianic moments will happen. Basically, God's seven appointed feasts foretell the very day when the Messiah, Jesus, will accomplish his most important achievements and the exact day of his return at the sound of a trumpet. So let's look at this. God set up a yearly observance of all seven 
of these feasts for the Israelites way back when they were out in the wilderness, right after they had just escaped Egypt. So it was roughly 1300 BC, over a thousand years before Jesus would arrive. And these feasts are written in Leviticus chapter 23. God gave the name of the feast, what was it to be about, and the very day it was to be observed each year based upon a lunar calendar. A lunar calendar means the months were based upon the moon cycle. Each month started and ended with the new moon. We actually get our word month from the idea of a new moon. God commanded the Israelites to celebrate these festivals or these appointed times each year, just like we keep holidays today. In fact, the word holiday literally came from these feasts, for they were also known as the holy days, which forms the word holiday. But just keep in mind, the Israelites had no clue that these feasts, these appointed times, were actually foretelling the exact days when Jesus would accomplish his most important tasks. In fact, the very essence of what each feast was about was the very essence of what Jesus had to fulfill on that day. This is completely amazing and wonderful to me. I love how God set this up. So here's the order of the feasts set up in Leviticus 23. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. In Leviticus 23, we're given the basic instructions for celebrating these festivals. In celebrating each of these festivals, there are themes Jesus would fulfill in his first coming and will fulfill in his second coming. The Spring Feasts jesus fulfilled at his first coming on the day of those events i would encourage everyone to study out some of these feasts read a book about the feasts of god and jesus's role in them and you'll get a much deeper appreciation for some of the events and the reasons why we do some of the things that we do and call Jesus some of the names we call him. But many lessons about the Feast of the Lord focus in on the what they mean. And so many times when you read a book about the Feast of the Lord or hear a sermon on them, much of the emphasis or the lesson is about the great deep meaning behind the rituals or the ceremonies. And they're, they're amazing and they're great. But there's a time tracking aspect to all of them that people feel a little nervous focusing on or even just don't consider that there is a time tracking aspect to each of the feasts of the Lord. In Colossians 2 verse 17, which we'll talk about later, Paul mentions some of these feasts as only a shadow of things to come. Today, we would probably describe them as like a movie preview that we get to act out. So let me give you a brief description of all these feasts of the Lord. The first three feasts occurred in the spring over an eight-day period during the lunar month of Nisan. Passover was on the 14th. Unleavened bread ran for the next seven days from the 15th to the 21st. And first fruits occurred during the week of unleavened bread on the day after the weekly Sabbath. And God declared the month of Nisan as the first month of the year on a new religious calendar for the Jews. The fourth feast of the year, the Feast of Weeks, was to take place 50 days, seven weeks plus one day, after the Feast of First Fruits. So it arrived late spring during the third lunar month of the year, the month of Sivan. The last three feasts occurred in the fall during the seventh month of the year, the month of Tishri. Trumpets occurred on the first day of the month, the Day of Atonement on the 10th, and the Feast of Tabernacles ran for seven days from the 15th to the 21st. These three feasts are collectively known as the Fall Feasts of the Lord. So the first feast we can talk about is Passover. The most popular one, everyone kind of knows a little bit about Passover. But this feast originated in the Exodus from Egypt. Israel was slaves to Egypt and God sent Moses and Aaron 
to let his people go. And they were able to escape by God's mighty hand. And one of the final acts of the final plague that allowed Pharaoh to change his mind and release the captives, if not for a few days, was the Passover. This was when each family was to take a young lamb, older than one year, but not to two years, keep it into their home and then slaughter it and sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of their house. And everyone inside would be safe from the destroying angel who would come to kill the firstborn son of any household that did not have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Now, a lot of people don't know all the requirements for the Lamb of God given to us. They are, one, it had to be an unblemished lamb. The lamb chosen for the Passover had to be without blemish or defect. This symbolized the purity and perfection of the sacrifice offered to God. Two, it had to be a male lamb. The lamb had to be male, emphasizing strength and vitality. It had to be of the first year. The lamb had to be in its first year of life. One small timekeeping viewpoint that strays from the widely accepted three and a half year ministry of Jesus is that his ministry might have actually been 490 days from baptism to Pentecost, fulfilling the in its first year aspect of the Lamb requirement. But that's a whole nother video for another time. Another requirement would be the selection and inspection. Israelites were instructed to select the lamb on the 10th day of the first month and to keep it until the 14th day. During this time, they were to inspect the lamb to ensure its perfection and compliance with the other requirements. Number five, it was slaughtered at twilight. On the 14th day of the month, at twilight, the lamb was to be slaughtered. The blood of the lamb was then applied to the doorposts by hyssop and the lintel of the house's as a sign of protection. And finally, the last requirement, no broken bones. As a symbolic requirement, the instructions specified that none of the lamb's bones should be broken during the cooking or eating process. So here's what happened. The Jews have been celebrating this Passover feast for over a thousand years, and here comes Jesus along Earth's fourth millennium since creation and he dies on the cross. He's sacrificed on the very day the Passover lambs were sacrificed for the Feast of Passover. This feast was memorializing when the Israelites escaped their captors in Egypt, the night of the Exodus, Nisan 14. So here's Jesus being sacrificed on the very night of the sacrificial lamb, Jesus symbolically became the lamb, but he literally became the sacrifice that sets us free from our spiritual captivity to sin. Jesus fulfilled the role of the Passover lamb, and he fulfilled it on time. And by the way, the year Christ was crucified, Nisan 14 fell on the fourth day of the week, sundown Tuesday to sundown Wednesday. So Christ hung on the cross on a Wednesday afternoon. Okay, so Jesus' body was taken off the cross the same day, Nisan 14, and it was buried in the ground at sundown because the Jews wanted the bodies off the cross before the high Sabbath of the first day of unleavened bread arrived on Nisan 15. Christ's body then remained in the ground for three days and three nights in fulfillment of the Jonah prophecy. So Nisan 15, 16, and 17, all during the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Christ's sinless body was the unleavened bread that fulfilled this feast. So now we know Christ's death occurred on the very day of the yearly celebrated Feast of Passover, the first feast of the year, and we know his burial took place during the very days of the yearly celebrated Feast of Unleavened Bread, the second feast of the year. Guys, these are the biggest things Christ did for us, dying on the cross for us and living a sinless life. Oftentimes in the Bible, sin is symbolically described as leaven because it affects the whole loaf of bread. But what of his resurrection? Is there a feast day? 
for that as well. Well, next came the Feast of First Fruits, the third feast of the year. It occurred right after the weekly Sabbath day ends during the seven days of unleavened bread. So if you count three days and three nights from sundown Wednesday, when Christ's body was buried in the tomb, you come to sundown Saturday, the end of the weekly Sabbath. The weekly Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. So, right on cue, Jesus resurrected from the graves on the very day of the Feast of First Fruits, possibly as early as Saturday evening. Mary and Martha found the stone rolled away in the tomb already empty early Sunday morning while it was still dark. So here's the deal with first fruits. Jesus literally rose back from being dead. Like he was dead and then he was alive again. And he symbolically became the first fruits of everyone who would become the harvest of God's kingdom. That's three for three for keeping the themes on track and the appointments on time. Are you starting to see how these feast days are time trackers? Hit that like button if you agree, or type amen or something, which leads us to the Feast of Pentecost. Known in Hebrew as Shavuot, holds profound significance as an appointed time in the biblical calendar. In ancient Israel, this festival marked the culmination of the grain harvest and the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. It was a time of joyous celebration, gratitude for the harvest, and a confirmation of the covenant relationship between God and his people. Jesus gave profound meaning for Pentecost for the Jews and for his followers. Jesus, having risen from the dead already, instructed his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended on those who were waiting. This event not only symbolized the nations the kingdom was about to spread to, but also represented the giving of a new law, the law of the Spirit. The disciples were empowered to spread the message of Christ globally. Thus, Pentecost became a pivotal moment in Christianity, highlighting the fulfillment of the Old Testament theme of using God's law to be a light to the nations through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus asked them to wait until he was going to send them the Holy Spirit. This was a significant event. What kind of date do you suppose they would need to wait for? An appointed time. They didn't just wait a couple weeks or a few days or, you know, a significant number like the number seven days. They waited for the feast of Pentecost, the appointed time of Shavuot. So to recap what we've talked about already, Jesus fulfilled some of his most important tasks on the feast days of the Lord. His sacrificial death, his perfect life, his sinless life, and his resurrection from the dead, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, all on God's feast days. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. So now knowing that these events that he did happened on specific days that match the themes, let me ask you a question. What are the next three feasts that are going to happen? Do you know them? And why not? In today's church culture, the fall feasts of the Lord are kind of just a Jewish thing that we don't need to celebrate or even learn about. But the themes and the timing remain intact. There's three fall feast festivals left, all happening in the month of Tishri, the seventh lunar month of the religious calendar for the Hebrews. Do you think he's going to fulfill the fall feasts in the same way he did the spring feasts? Of course he is. He is going to fulfill not only their themes, but their appointed times. The next prophetic feast day or appointed time after Pentecost is the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Tura. After that comes the Day of Atonement and finally the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Trumpets or Yom Tura is Hebrew for a day of shouting or a day of trumpet blasts. This actually fulfills what is described as the day that Jesus is going to return to earth. Check out 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead 
in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. This is the verse that people actually get the rapture concept from, a gathering of us up into the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. But he is actually on his way to do something important. He is the king arriving. Back in the olden times, when a king would come to a city, a great procession would go out to meet him and kind of prepare the roads and prepare the way for the king's arrival. The Feast of Trumpets has lots of themes that connect with kingship. The trumpet blasts were often a way to herald the coming of a king, to gather attention. Everyone pay attention. He is coming. Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year, is the first day of the first of the civil calendar. The Hebrew people had two different start dates to their calendar, a civil which started in the fall and the month of Tishri, and the religious that started in the spring with Nisan. The Day of Trumpets always lands in the seventh month of the religious calendar, but is the first month in the civil calendar. The Feast of Trumpets is said to be the anniversary of the creation of the world, that God created the world in six days, that every year since is called Ad Moni, so A.M., the Feast of Trumpets is also the start of the 10 days of awe. These are 10 days that you're getting ready for the Day of Atonement, that you practice things in humility and rending our hearts to get ready for the next feast day. You can see examples of these themes um, blending together the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As far as these themes are going, we can see that his return and our resurrection are connected to a day of trumpets, of shouts, and that it's cloudy. The Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, stands as a crucial appointed time in the biblical calendar, carrying deep themes of repentance and reconciliation. In ancient Israel, this solemn day was marked by rituals of purification and atonement for sins. It's the only feast day with no historical aspect to it. Its focus is purely a future event where God does away with sin. In ancient Israel, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or later in the temple, offering sacrifices and seeking forgiveness on behalf of the entire nation. The ritual symbolized the need for cleansing and restoration of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. Remarkably, biblical prophecy points to God's ultimate fulfillment of the Day of Atonement through the person of Jesus Christ, the one whom they pierced. Zechariah 12.10 says they will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. There will be a remnant of Israel that survives the tribulation, and they will all mourn and repent and corporately be saved. Romans 11, 26 and 27 talks about as much. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The Day of Atonement isn't so much celebrated as it's observed and experienced. The greatness of it is the humbling nature of observing the Day of Atonement. The great themes are repentance, that you humble yourself before who God is, and you think about who you are in relation to that. And it's about corporate repentance, not just a person in individual homes, but a whole country in the future will repent on this day. 
And there's also great themes of God removing sin on this day. In the New Testament, Christ is portrayed as the ultimate high priest who, through his sacrificial death, offers eternal atonement for humanity's sins. The themes of repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation found in the Feast of the Day of Atonement find their ultimate expression in the redemptive work of Jesus. As described in various prophecies throughout the Bible, the central feature of Yom Kippur in ancient times was the high priest's entry into the Holy of Holies, making atonement for the sins of the nation through sacrificial offerings and prayers. Yom Kippur was a day of intense fasting, prayer, and repentance. The people all sought forgiveness for their sins, reflecting on their actions and trying to make amends. Another detail about Yom Kippur is white clothing. It's common for individuals to wear white clothing on Yom Kippur, symbolizing purity, humility, and the aspiration to approach God with a clean heart. And lastly, we get to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. This feast is awesome. In Hebrew, it is called Sukkot, and it holds a significant place as an appointed time in the biblical calendar. Its emphasized themes are gratitude, provision, divine dwelling with us. In ancient Israel, this festival marked the culmination of the harvest season. The people would construct temporary shelters, or Sukkots, to dwell in for seven days symbolizing the Israelites' journey through the wilderness and their reliance on God's provisions. It had a rich theme of a wedding celebration. In fact, many weddings today have the husband and bride under a little wooden overhang that got its origins from a sukkah. The Feast of Tabernacles was a time of communal joy, celebration, and offerings at the temple. In prophetic terms, the Feast of Tabernacles carries significance in the fulfillment of God's promises. Zechariah 14 envisions a future scenario where all nations will come to celebrate Sukkot in Jerusalem, highlighting a time of universal peace and recognition of God's sovereignty. Interestingly enough, in Zechariah 14, after the battle between Jesus and the Antichrist is done, there are nations left over that did not join with the Antichrist. And they have the option to come to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. And if they don't, there are consequences. Think about that for a second. If you want to know my thoughts about that, I'll make another video about that. So the Feast of Tabernacles has themes of a wedding celebration, a gathering of both the wheat and the barley harvests. All the harvests are done. There's also the great theme that God is tabernacling with us. The tabernacle in the Old Testament was a tent that people could see God's presence was with them in their camp. And so they knew that God was tabernacling with them. And finally, there's the celebration of the entire world, celebrating the lordship of Jesus, king of the world, the celebration of his rule beginning, along with the rule of his bride. All right, so in this video, I've tried to put a best case for the Feast of Trumpets as Jesus's day of return. But how do we reconcile the day or hour no one knows with a day that we can know? How do we mesh Leviticus 23's appointed times with Matthew 24, 36's day or hour no one knows concept? How can Matthew 24, 36 be true if we can know that the day of trumpets is the next appointed time? To answer this, let's go back and remember in Genesis, where God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars for a specific purpose, to keep track of the appointed times. And this is especially important for the moon. All the feasts have dates set during a month already begun, except for the Feast of Trumpets. 
The Feast of Trumpets was the only feast day to occur at the start of a lunar month, the first day of the month. The moon goes dark for one and a half to three days. And in the lunar calendar, the months start at the first sighting of the moon, not its disappearance. So this important holiday, an appointed time from God, who commanded the Israelites to observe, was actually very hard to find. It couldn't be calculated with accuracy and was not officially known until two separate witnesses, often watchmen during the night, confirmed sighting of the new moon sliver to the leader of the Sanhedrin. Because it was so difficult to find, it was often the watchman's job during the night to spot the new moon. So as well as looking for the sword coming against their country, the watchmen on the walls would have trumpets with them. And so they were actually well equipped to be the ones to spot the new moon and herald in this feast day, the Feast of Trumpets. Think about how crazy it is to try to celebrate this holiday. From one and a half to three days, the sighting of the moon could happen at any hour. And God wants you and commands you to celebrate this holiday if you're an ancient Israelite and you want to invite some people over, maybe family and friends. You need to prepare the food all this with a level of uncertainty because we don't know if we've seen the first sliver of the moon yet to start the holiday. Even today, Rosh Hashanah is celebrated over two days just in case they get the day wrong and they want to be safe and sure to obey God. So they celebrate just both days. But back in ancient times, it's very likely that a nickname for this holiday started, an idiom, if you will of the day or hour no one knows. Is it going to be on the 30th or the 29th since the last month started? Who knows? And so you will find Jesus using a lot of these key words and phrases in Matthew chapter 24. When asked about his return, he mentions the phrase of the day or hour no man knows, and also the phrase so keep watch. It's tragic today that much like a new moon, the meaning of this phrase has been hidden from the church. And the light that shines forth is the Jewish people, the Jewish culture. Their feast days shine light on the meaning behind Jesus' words. Instead of just not thinking about when Jesus is going to return because no one knows the day or hour, it's of the day or hour no one knows is when he will return. Instead of trying to conceal information, Jesus is trying to reveal information about a time tracking aspect of the feast day, day of trumpets. So whenever anyone mentions this quote, we can't know the day or hour, correct them because Jesus actually said of the day or hour no one knows. And in Matthew 24, verse 42, it says, Therefore, be on the alert, or watch, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Revelation 3, verse 3 says, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. This is a challenge for some church to change their ways so that he will not come like a thief, which means that they would know and expect his return. So there you have it, another time trackers in the Bible, the Moedim, or the appointed times of Leviticus 23, especially the Feast of Trumpets. So could you put together all the time trackers we've talked about to find the day of his return? Tune back on my next video, putting it all together. But for now, I'll close out with these encouraging scriptures. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. 
1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. In Daniel 12, 9, and 10, he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. The only way not to be surprised the day something occurs is to know in advance the day of when it is to occur, and we are told we will not be surprised. But what about us being told that we will know the hour? I'm not sure about the hour. What scriptures do you think describe the time of day or night as Jesus' return? One I know at least gives the weather cloudy. But I'll close this video with a final verse, and consequently might have our clue in it. Mark 13, 34-37 It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he suddenly come and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. God bless. Thanks for watching this video. Let me know if you liked it, have any questions or disagreements or any supporting scriptures. Please put them down in the comments below. Take care.